Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We're just going to wait two more minutes to let our uh, viewers trickle in, and then we'll get started. Okay, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Megan McCray, and I'm the Bicom Museums Program and Coordinator. I would like to thank you all for joining us for our third Beyond Bicom Lecture of the Fall 2023 season. And please to welcome our guest speakers, Paulus Pierce and Dr. Dominic Marshall, to discuss disability rights and advocacy in Ottawa and beyond. Okay, so while we're meeting virtually, it remains important to recognize the land and Bytown Museum the common state resides on. The City of Ottawa, the Ottawa Locks, and the Bytown Museum are built on the traditional unceded territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation. The peoples of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation have lived on this territory for millennia. Their culture and presence have nurtured and continue to nurture this place. The Bytown Museum honors the peoples and the land of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation. This evening's lecture will be centered around disability rights and advocacy. The Bytown Museum is committed to providing high quality visitor experiences for persons of all ages and capabilities. The Bytown Museum's 2023 Accessibility Plan outlines measures to ensure the best possible access to all the museum's exhibits and programs in a manner that promotes the dignity, independence, integration, and equal opportunity. The commitment extends to residents, visitors, stakeholders, volunteers, and employees with visible or non-visible disabilities. <clears throat> For those viewers who have visited the museum, you are most likely aware that the Bytown Museum or the Commissariat was built in 1827 and was therefore not built to be accessible. In turn, Bytown Museum continues to explore new ways to address the barriers to accessibility. Thus far, the museum has partnered with Parks Canada to build a modern, accessible washroom on the first floor. The museum has installed a ramp at the front of the door entrance to allow easy access to those with walkers and wheelchairs. Sorry about that. While the museum has installed an elevator to take visitors to the second floor, we are still exploring ways to make sure the third floor is more accessible. The Bytown Museum does currently have a virtual tour of these exhibitions on the second and third floor. The virtual tour is available on the monitor on the second floor of the museum, but it can also be used at home on the museum's website. This use of technology addresses the inability of the elevator to extend to the third floor due to the original building of the building. However, the museum recognizes that its commitment to accessibility is an ongoing process and it consistently strives to provide high quality visit experience to all the guests. Okay, I would now like to introduce our two guest speakers for tonight's lecture. So first, Hollis Pierce. Uh, so Hollis has an undergraduate and graduate degree from Carleton University, business in history and a specialization in digital communities. He has acted as a research consultant with Carleton University on a project that was inspired by his graduate thesis on academic accessibility. During his years at Carleton, he was a co-organizer of that camp, the Humanities and Tech Camp. That looks at how the digital communities can help disabled individuals succeed in academia. Paulus was a team leader in the accessibility audit at both the Ottawa Folk Festival from 2008 to 2010 and Ottawa Blues Fest in 2010. 
He was highlighted by Catherine Clark for her Canada 150 project, and he received the Provost Scholarly Award in 2015. Hollis has also received the George Garth Graham Digital History Research Fellowship and the Ottawa Health Celebration People Award. Hollis has recently launched his podcast called 21st Century Disability, an analysis of what it is like to live in the 21st century as a person with a disability. Our second speaker, Dr. Dominic Marshall, is a professor of history at Carleton University. He teaches and researches the paths of social policies, children's rights, humanitarian aid, disability, and tech, refugees, and the extraction of Nazi resources. She coordinates with the Carleton University Disability Research Group, the Canadian Network on Humanitarian History, which supports the rescue of archives of Canadian development and aid. She is a co-investigator of the SSHRC Funded Partnership Local Engagement Refugee Research Network. Her recent writing includes Creating, Archiving, and Exhibiting exhibiting the D Disability History, the Oral Histories of Disability Activists of the Carleton University Disability Research Group, and Teaching Human Rights History. Okay, so our lecture will begin with a presentation of our two speakers, and then we will dive into the Q&A period. Uh, if you're watching from the Facebook live stream, leave a question, leave it in the comments, and we'll get back to you uh, in the Zoom. I will now pass it off to our speakers. Please enjoy everyone. Okay. Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for taking the time to uh, watch this uh, on a cold uh, Thursday night. Uh, so uh, I will start by introducing our research project, the Carlton University Research Group. Let me if I can get to the next slide. Just a sec here. And uh, this is the page one of our website. I will show that to you how to get there after. But uh, we were created in 2013. Both Hollis and I are a member of it. And uh, we were a bunch of um, scholars of different uh, disciplines, mainly at the beginning, a social worker with, about whom we will talk later, Roy Haynes, and a medical engineer. Uh, Adrian Chan both wanted to share their knowledge to show Adrian's students in particular who work in technology and learn to be engineers how there were marvelous things done in the past very often by disability people themselves that were technological innovations that were uh, interesting and that could inspire these students and out of this uh, a historian me joined and a librarian George who was in the uh, audience tonight joined and then uh, we gathered many uh, disability people in NGOs in Ottawa, which fits tonight's um, theme of uh, disability rights in the area. And uh, we a part of our interdisciplinary groups were a lot of people with disability themselves, which was very important to us. And over the 10 years of our existence, we have had in our teams many undergraduate students, graduate students, who have joined uh, to do research and events uh, with us. Uh, our main product in the end is this series of exhibits, which you see on the uh, right-hand side of your screen. We have uh, six now, and two of them, number two and three on your screen, are uh, a series of webinars that we have organized over the past four years. One on disability futurity, which is an imaginative one, and another one uh, on scholars meet activists. And we will refer to these things as we uh, go along. Uh, this, the one with the little wheel in the middle is particularly interesting for the history of human rights, which is what uh, occupies us tonight, the history of rights in the region. Uh, this uh, documents that one, the role of Canadians and Canadian people with disability in the creation uh, of the uh, United Nations Conventions of the Right of People with Disability uh, of 2006. So they were very important, and we'll come back to that later. So tonight we will uh, talk around 10 slides, one on education, one on technology, one on elevators, one on social workers, sports, housing, arts, humanitarian aid, Indigenous people, and we'll talk to you at the end about our new exhibits which we are launching tonight on the occasion of this uh, meeting and so with the first slides uh, Hollis will start up to you Hollis. Yes thank you Dominic. Uh, again as Dominic and uh, Megan were saying that uh, for my MA thesis I analyzed the academic accessibility 
uh, of the post-secondary world using um, Carleton University as a case study. Um, the idea was actually inspired uh, by my love of reading and being in libraries. And even though I cannot open a book on my own, ironically. Um, I, so what I, how I accomplished the um, project was by uh, looking at the issue from three different lenses. Uh, so first of all, with my personal vignettes, um, the physical and physical audit of the campus. Then I looked at the board of directors meeting minutes of the uh, uh, of Charles in its histories, and also put together a, a group of oral histories of professors and university staff and former students. Um, and from there, I determined how the post-secondary world defines the term accessibility. Um, and as you can see in the slides, um, I you can see a photo in the top left of myself uh, trying to open a, a door access with my headrest, which was very awkward at times. And um, then you can see an older photo of the tunnels from years ago in the middle and a, um, a chart on the top right corner um, uh, that I, where it was like results from my uh, physical audit that I completed in, um, in throughout the study. And, as you can see, I the the older buildings were dramatically uh, less accessible than the newer ones, and uh, Dominique was very generous to add in the photo on the bottom right of what some tunnels under the library look like today. Um, and looking into the basement of the library. And during my day there, I, I had to go up into the library from the tunnels to go down into their uh, interior elevator to get to that area. Um, so to Dominique, I'll let you take it on the next slide. The picture Holly said the bottom left is the result of some of your uh, complaining here, where you can just push on the anywhere on that bar and open the door, which yeah. was not possible at the beginning. Absolutely, so, sorry. Thank you. For that. I yeah. missed that one. You're right. And these old tunnels, which were built initially as a service thing to be able to service, because Carlton is a campus in many buildings, so in the winter it's hard to service ended up being uh, pr um, uh, liked by people who had uh, mobility problems and attracted quite a few people um, with disability in early on in the history of Carlton. And with over the years, Carlton has used this to uh, become you know, more and more accessible and now uh, praises itself in being one of the most accessible campuses in uh, Canada. Uh, okay, so the next uh, slide is about technology. So I told you that the um, meeting of the social worker, uh, Roy, and the uh, medical engineer, Adrian, made for, there was a common attempt to document technology uh, and uh, for more access. And so what we decided to do, we didn't know what we'd do at first, is these exhibits on to Canadians with disability who uh, designed uh, uh, technologies for access. So it's very much in the spirit of the human rights that uh, Megan would like us to talk about tonight, because it's seeing people with disability, this convention, not as objects of charity, but as the authors of their own 
destiny and at, as subjects of rights themselves. So we documented these three examples of uh, people with disability who, uh, through their own uh, learning, ingenuity, and identification of problems, ended up contributing to the technology uh, history of Canada. So on the left, Jane, James Swell, engineer, uh, worked at the National Research Council in Canada and put together a lot, not only this card reader, but a lot of implements to uh, help people with visual impairment be able to use uh, digital uh, and uh, computer technology, in this case, a card reader for people with uh, a visual impairment. Uh, Roland Gallarneau, that was uh, in the 50s and 60s. Roland Gallarneau in the 60s, uh, an engineer who was almost completely blind, uh, built uh, the first ever uh, text-to-speech machine, uh, which uh, afterwards was commercialized. And he did that in his basement in Gatineau. He had his own um, lab, a workshop, where to build all that with, uh, like James Wells, all sorts of tools and places and ways of walking about that uh, were um, custom made for him. And this is his machine at the top right. And the three images at the bottom uh, right are uh, at the complete right is the Starks family who uh, uh, were not happy with their Royal Bank of Canada on Bank Street. So this, these are all Ottawa stories and uh, sued uh, the Royal Bank of Canada for not wanting to make their automatic uh, teller uh, accessible for people who were blind. And through the Human Rights Commission uh, won the case. And so then the Royal Bank of Canada, instead of being hostile, became collaborative. They hired this businesswoman who herself is a woman with disability to help design the mechanism by which the uh, the automatic, uh, the ATM would be speaking if you brought your um, headphones. And this bank, Royal Bank of Canada, if you know it, close to uh, Spark Street in uh, Ottawa, is the first ever place in the world to have a speaking ATM. Now there are thousands of them all over the world. And then it took another person, Doreen Damas, who, uh, about whom I will talk later, to do the same for TD Bank. So it was not all one at the same time. But now we take these things for granted. And this is really a case where uh, people with disability have uh, you know made a world for themselves uh, with the help of allies, but really has have taken the political and um, and you could say engineering lead in uh, in making these things. So uh, up to you, all this about elevators. Thanks to you. Thank you very much, Dominic. Um, yes, and so uh, as Dominic. Was saying elevator access is, is a major issue uh, that we found, um, well, especially I found throughout my years of uh, being at Carleton. And uh, that was also a major influence on my project or my thesis project. And so we have uh, developed a project. Um, to install a, a mode of accessing the elevator in Patterson Hall at Carleton University uh, that you can use an app called Contactless Access to call the elevator and then go in it and then tell the elevator which floor you would like to access. And this is a brilliant technology that we were able to access with the help of Dean Melway, who's uh, a administrator of Access Accessibility Institute um, and a former Carleton uh, alumni and uh, aid at the Paul Menton Center. And with his help and along with Kay Wang, uh, an engineer, they developed the app together, which is now also being used at Pearson Airport, which is phenomenal. Um, 
Now, it, it was also a great technology that I would have loved to use at uh, Patterson Hall because I had to go up to the fourth floor where, I, where you find the history department in at Carrollton. Uh, but up to uh, my final years, they had not yet had this access, unfortunately. Uh, so I have had many occasions accessing that elevator and having it being shut down while I was upstairs one time and even uh, another day getting stuck in the middle, like halfway in the elevator and halfway out. It was hilarious. So anyways, and that's a, a great accomplishment for um, both K. Lang, Dean Melway, and Carleton University. Off to you, Dominic, on the next slide. Thanks. As a transition here, uh, that was the technology was piloted at Carleton thanks to the group uh, that uh, we had formed. Uh, and it's because uh, because of COVID and the need of a technology where you didn't have to touch things that they put installed it at Pearson Airport. So the technology which was developed for access, uh, physical access for people with disability became a technology which served everyone in, uh, in a time where touching things uh, is more difficult. And Hollis interviewed uh, Ki Wang, who's also, as you see there, is in, a, is in an electric wheelchair. Um, uh, also has a disability who has always been uh, tinkering with interesting things for his own self and then he did it for his own building and then the technology of Carlton allowed him to pilot it for commercial buildings um, but up to there K1 was doing um, these things uh, at a loss but this so it's one of the first project there that gave some kind of profitability. Yes absolutely and as you say Dominic there's countless amounts of uh, technologies out there that are like critical for the disabled community, but they don't get installed often until there is other reasons for the general public to use them, like in the uh, in the pandemic. Yeah. Okay, next slide, social work. So here is a picture of our uh, good friend and colleague, Roy Hennies. He's at the, in the middle, uh, in the square, uh, the checkered shirt, but also in the middle of the table there uh, when the CU, our, our group of research presented at a, a, a fair about community engagement at Carlton University. And so we have also these exhibits that are uh, physical. And uh, Roy gave uh, at Carlton University more than three decades ago, the first uh, uh, course completely about social work and disability. So Carlton School of Social Work became a center uh, to learn these things and a center where many scholars of disability converged. And so Roy ended up uh, over the last decade co-editing uh, some of the main readers in the history of disability, one in, in a Canadian one, Untold Stories, and one transnational one, um, the Routledge History of Disability. Uh, and it became also a, a center for study. So one of the persons we, in, uh, we're going to talk about later, Joanne Francis, who became a social worker herself, was a partly trained with Roy. Roy had a, uh, was also working as a social worker uh, with people who were paraplegic, helping transitions between homes and uh, independent uh, living. Uh, and for his own PhD thesis, he studied the history of associations of crippled and four crippled children in Canada. Okay, uh, and then you could see there uh, some of our collaborator, Beth Robertson, who's a historian, and Sandy Barron at the back, who I think is also in the audience. So hello, Sandy. Up to you, uh, Hollis on sport. Thank you, Dominic. Yes. So, uh, in uh, the Ottawa area, there has been a great development of uh, sporting communities um, 
together, coming together and just playing sports with no matter what their ability. Uh, and a major, one of the major examples of this is the Ottawa Power Wheelchair Hockey League that was established over a decade ago by myself and a group of friends. And from now, uh, from throughout our time, we have been able to develop not only a small group of players to play inter interleague games, but also compete internationally. Um, and that is one of the, the photo, the big photo on the right is a photo from 2014 when we sent the Ottawa Capitals, our traveling team or our team of best players uh, to go compete in Minnesota at the North American Championships. And uh, you can see myself uh, on the right. I'm a, I was a defenseman for the Ottawa Capitals. And uh, on the left is a photo, uh, a more recent photo of some of our players and uh, traveling team. And Sandy Barron, again, is a guest, making a guest appearance in that photo as well. So hello, Sandy. Um, and uh, more recently, though, there have been other leagues uh, coming together for uh, to aid individuals with different disabilities, such as Ottawa Bocce Leagues. And even um, in the summertime, I have never participated in this, but uh, a baseball league. Um, uh, so I hope to get out in the next summer. But now there's even another uh, league in Ottawa for hockey um, for power wheelchairs called Power Hockey Ottawa, which is a uh, less contact sport that is more, that's played more around like soccer. And, um, and it is played along international rules that they play also in Europe. And we hope to have this sport um, soon adapted into the Paralympics. So from now on, into the next slide, here's to you, Dominic. Thank you. Uh, so the next slide is about independent living and incarcerations. And there's a good transition here because Keenan Weller, the person that we are mentioning at the bottom right, who is uh, the director of Live, Work and Play, is also concerned with questions of access to sport and the right to participate in sports. So there is the kinds of sport that Holly spoke about, which are leagues that are made and sports that are made with people with uh, various uh, abilities. But there is also uh, organizations like Keenan's who are actually working to place people who have uh, different abilities within groups uh, regular groups of uh, sports people. So it's another uh, approach for different kinds of sport uh, that is also very, um, you could say, uh, alive and well in Ottawa and speaks to the right of access to leisure and which often goes against this kind of gloom and doom idea of disability of people accessing the very basic and nothing else. And a lot like also when we speak about libraries so this, uh, in our series of webinar, we had one on housing and we had two guests, Keenan, who was sp speaking about live, work and play. And it was the, the live thing that we wanted to talk about. And Megan Linton, who is a doctoral student at Carlton, who studies uh, incarceration and institutions. And so Megan has a podcast like Hollis, hers is called Invisibility in Invisible Institutions. And she does a lot of research amongst people who live in institutions to partly to own the data, to be able to count. Uh, she's a person with disability as well herself and to be able to count what's going on in institutions and make what's going on visible, uh, sometimes to show the worst and also to help uh, with the best. And uh, she was, for instance, during the pandemic, one of the main person who advocated for a uh, 
a fair and reasonable distribution of vaccines uh, using her knowledge and her activism uh, to do this. Uh, she also, like Keenan, advocates independent living, and Keenan spoke when he came to our webinar, which you can listen to on our exhibit, uh, spoke of this example, this multi-faith housing called the Haven in Barhaven, where 10 of the 98 um, houses, which are built by a coalition of churches, uh, are built for people with disability, uh, for them to uh, live independently. And that kind of um, uh, project is uh, sadly a, a minority of projects, but uh, Keenan is advocating for more. And recently, the CUDRGR group has tried to convince Carlton University that when they develop the uh, northern part of campus for uh, social housing, that they adopt a similar uh, model. Uh, Megan, when she speaks about institutions, is also very critical of all the uh, money-making interests be behind uh, the uh, all the pharmaceutical products that are given routinely uh, and without much discrimination to people in institutions, and also the monetary interests beside behind the building of restraints and um, you could say uh, all the, the trappings of incarceration, which she heavily uh, criticizes. And now up to Hollis for the arts. Thank you, Dominic. Uh, yes. So many, um, Ottawa is just filled, a uh, city filled with arts and culture, and it's just so history everywhere you look in terms of the arts. And um, there, throughout the past decade, there have been many disabled local artists uh, who have been gaining more public awareness over the past decade. And perhaps the most prominent of those artists is a man named Chris Minkowski, or how he refers to himself as Bucko in when he's participating in busking or bucko arts for his painting. Um, and he, he uh, just like me, has a uh, serious uh, neuromuscular disorder called spinal muscular atrophy. Um, but amazingly, he continues to this day to develop an amazing just an amazing amount of art. And he is both a visual artist as well as a musician, busking in the, in, in the buyer's market and has shown his art in many places, including a special showing at Shanghai Restaurant here in Chinatown. His most prestigious showing though, came in 2019 when his art was displayed at Tangled Arts in Disability Toronto. Uh, and you can tell from his painting on the bottom left of the corner uh, slide here, he has all of the art that he develops is very abstract um, and very a mix of colors and shades and just fantastic. And he was listed on as one of CBC Ottawa's trailblazers back in 2021. And in, in an interview uh, for that award with Nick Schofield, he stated, every time that I perform music live, it is an act of advocacy for inclusion and disability. Over, over the past 10 years, I, Chris Minkowski, have witnessed Ottawa become more inclusive and more, and many more people with disabilities active throughout the arts community. So, and a lot of this growth is from people like Chris, who, as he says, just does anything that he wants in order to 
gain advocacy and uh, publicity by just being there, being present. So on to you, Dominic. Before I change slide, we put a little thing at the top here in the middle on museum and accessibility as a tribute to Megan and her efforts, the efforts of our team to make the Bytown Museum more accessible. Uh, we had it as part of one of our webinars about uh, activists and scholar, a whole session on museum and access, uh, which uh, paid tribute to people like you and your efforts to make these places of uh, culture uh, uh, more accessible, but also more inclusive in their display. Absolutely. So the next slide, this is my specialty, humanitarian aid and human rights. And uh, I was trying to find Ottawa stories here. So at the bottom right is, whoops, I'm, I'm going ahead of myself here. At the bottom right is the Canadian um, National Institute for the Blind, one of the oldest uh, NGOs uh, this uh, in Canada, 1919, uh, not uh, by chance, just after World War I. Uh, at the end of World War II, the refugee camps of Europe were almost empty and the people who were left were the people that nobody wanted, the unwanted, they like to call themselves, uh, and amongst them, many people with disability. And it's them in their own camps who advocated uh, transnationally to find places to go. And so some blind people uh, convince some su the Swedish Institute for the Blind and the Canadian Institute for the Blind to bring them over. They knew very well that these people uh, would uh, not be, uh, you know, there were ways they would not be unwanted uh, by the CNIB. And CNIB organized their travel and organized also that you see there's the kinds of watch that they were uh, giving them uh, on arrival. And uh, this is one of them, uh, East European man who came with, it, and you see him there with his dog and his uh, cane, and they welcomed also uh, their families, their wives and children. Uh, so that's end of World War One. Here on the left, you have Disabled Peoples International, which was incorporated in 1981 in Canada, but it's a bunch of people from all over the world who were a kind of breakaway group for from the former international groups of people advocating for people with disability who did not want to pass a motion to say that a majority of the people in the association should be people with disability themselves, like nothing without about them without them. So they broke away, created their own association, Disabled Peoples International 1981. Uh, incorporated in Canada, no, but uh, uh, a lot thanks to the Mennonite, Mennonite Central Committee and these um, activists for social justice and human rights, uh, the Mennonites who had always been at the forefront of Canadian fights for any kind of human rights. And to this day, Manitoba, where the Mennonites are concentrated, is really uh, a force for uh, 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 the rights of people with disability. And there's a whole exhibit about that. Uh, in our uh, eight exhibits there on our website. And uh, you see them, uh, the number uh, from the left to the right, number three and five are Henry Enns and Al Simpson, who were both uh, Manitoba-based advocates for people uh, with disability. And then if you follow the trace, you follow the trace of their action, it's, it, get, it brings you straight to the United Nations Conventions for the Right of people with disability. And one of the things they did, which places like the Canadian National uh, Institute for the Blind didn't, is they put every people with disability, they welcomed them in the same movement. That was a big transformation. And together with this idea that people with disability would advocate for their rights and they were not objects of charity. And at the top right are two images that are attributed to Ted Itany, a Japanese Canadian who was interned during World War II, like most of his co-nationals who were considered enemy aliens, something about which the Mulroney government apologized in the 1980s. Itani, uh, not, uh, you know, with full of spirit, uh, enlisted in the army in the 1950s anyway, became for almost four decades a Canadian soldier, and on his retirement, a Red Cross uh, volunteer, and did tons uh, in uh, to try to ban landmines, which is one of the big 
uh, problems in maiming and the creation of disability through war and violence and uh, the role of the Canadian Red Cross in that and the Convention Against Landmine are all based in Ottawa. So uh, internationally, Ottawa is known for that advocacy. And on the in the corner, there is an exhibit that my students made about the work of Itani. Itani gave some of his archives to Carleton University Archives and uh, about, uh, about landmines and disability and the role of the uh, Red Cross. Uh, Okay, and the last slide is still me talking. It's about indigenous disability, the one but last slide, indig indigenous disability activists. So uh, last 10 days ago, we had one, our last webinar of our series about scholars meet activists with the widow and the daughter of Wendell Nicholas. And you see here his Twitter account. He meets me and he's meeting everybody who does disability activism in Canada. He went to uh, New York for the UN uh, when the around the making of the not only the United Nations uh, Convention on Disability Activists, but also the United uh, Co Nation Conventions on the Rights for uh, uh, Indigenous People to try to make sure that is this is my phone. Sorry about this. Uh, to make sure that people with disability, indigenous people with disability were included in the United Nations Convention for the Right of Indigenous Peoples. And uh, two other people that are really interesting, uh, Aquasasne based Joan Francis, uh, who also passed away a few years ago. All these people passed away very recently. Joan was um, uh, an athlete. She participated in the Olympics, very much in the uh, way that uh, Hollis was talking about, uh, and around her act activity for uh, people with disability in sports. She became more generally uh, an activist for people with Indigenous people with disability. She worked in close collaboration with Wendell. Wendell uh, was always he was he was called Wendell writer letter Thomas because he was uh, Nicholas because he was writing letters to everyone and their opposite to advocate uh, for uh, what he called uh, from isolation to self determination a slogan that served his disability activism and his indigenous activism and Doreen Damas who passed away sadly this summer. We interviewed her uh, uh, two years ago, uh, was based in Manitoba, uh, like uh, ENDS and uh, the People of Disabled People International, and advocated her for a TD bank to have an ATM. But there you see her at the United Nations. She was part of the subcommittee of the United Nations uh, Writing Committee for the Convention of the People uh, indigenous people, and she was the one on the subcommittee for Canada on the subcommittee for people with disability. Um, she was also uh, an academic uh, in her own right. And the last slide, uh, whole this is about our exhibit. So I'll, I'll let you speak. Thank you, Dominic. Yes, so um, as Dominic was mentioning, uh, our most recent project with the CUDRG is called the Oral Histories of Activists in Disability Rights Movement. Um, and it actually uh, was inspired by my thesis. And um, it came about when I was defending my thesis in front of Roy Haynes, uh, as Dominic spoke of earlier. Um, who's a social or used to be a social worker uh, professor at Carleton about how it would be a great exhibit for the CRDRG to put on. And we've interviewed uh, oral histories of many dis disabled activists um, for this project. And the site is being uh, launched today. Am I correct in that? Uh, yeah, Dominique. So um, after the webinar that we have going on today, um, you can feel free to explore our project. Maybe you can go in a bit more detail into it, uh, Dominique. Yes, uh, some of the people we discovered there and who we interviewed and for this and other people were actually 
uh, we discovered because people like you told us about them after events that we staged. So don't hesitate to write to us if you think of this, because it's still an open uh, a bank of um, of interviews. And it's really what in history we call creating archives. Like these histories are not well known. This is what uh, bothered Roy Haynes and that he shared during the defense of Holy's uh, thesis. For instance, the nurse who helped create the extraordinary program of attendance for people with disability at Carlton, which allow people who could not otherwise attend university to uh, be there, uh, passed away a few years ago before uh, she could be interviewed. And Roy saw these things happening and uh, saw the urgency of having to uh, interview a lot of veterans of uh, disability activism. So five of the people of this 12, a list of 12 we've mentioned today, uh, we're happy to talk about others if you want. And we, for our last slides, we put uh, one article here. And if you're interested, it's on my website where uh, we're talking about all of the CUDRG has done over the past. So all the stuff we mentioned is uh, mentioned one way or the other. And the second article is by a University of Ottawa scholar um, who has given, and Miguel, one of the main uh, human rights lecture last year, and he spoke of people with disability. All this to say that Ottawa is a very important center for the study of disability uh, rights. And so thank you, don't hesitate to join us. Absolutely. Thank you, Hollis and Dominique for that wonderful and educational PowerPoint. I hope our audience took away some information from it. I know I definitely did. Um, so now we're going to jump into the Q&A period of our, our lecture. So I'll kick it off with some questions, but if you're in the audience and you have some questions for either or both of our speakers, please feel free to send them in the chat and we will get to them um, as we go. So I think uh, my first lecture for both of you would uh, just be kind of like generally, what did the movement for disability rights look like in Ottawa and how did that translate to the rest of Canada? Either of you can give it a go if you feel confident. <laughs> I'll, let, uh, I'll let you uh, take a track of that. First, okay, so what you're asking, Megan, is is there something that Ottawa does that radiates for the whole of Canada? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I think in Ottawa, as like the center of the country, is there something that they sparked that um, kind of translated to the rest of the country? Or even uh, like I think the best, the question backwards is easier to answer. Like because Ottawa is uh, the center of government, people come anyway. Like Wendell is from, Wendell Nicholas is from, uh, Mi'kmaq Eastern provinces, but he was always in Ottawa because this is where that he could do a lot of his advocacy. And it is where the Assembly of First Nations does a lot of its advocacy as well. Um, there is also, um, you know, although Disabled People International were incorporated uh, in uh, Manitoba, they did a lot of their representations through Ottawa and they were financed by the Canadian International Development Agency and all that. So there's a lot of Ottawa, you've got to come here because it's the capital. But amongst the activists that we showed you, I said, you know, Roy was the first to have a disability social work class. And then he was very important after that in the Canadian Association of Social Workers to expand this and to help other places do the same and also to transform the uh, Association of Social Worker to itself become more inclusive of social workers with disability. And you see uh, in the case of uh, Joanne Francis and in the case of Hollis, people who are from Ottawa, like people in other provinces, but Ottawa has its share, they're trying to push the uh, uh, definition of what uh, uh, sports, uh, including Olympic sports for people with disability look like. Uh, on housing, I'm afraid we're not really in advance. Actually, that is what uh, uh, our guest was deploring. We're quite, uh, 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 you know, running after others. Uh, on libraries, Canada, George is there to speak about that. Canada is very interesting for its history of lending libraries for people with disability, uh, partly because it's got a really good tradition of lending libraries in rural areas. There's a lot of, you know, distant communities in, in uh, Canada. 
I don't think it's Ottawa based, but there Canada has a, an interesting thing to say uh, to the world, and the same for um, Disability International, I think. Holis, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, well, and just also um, in terms of education, especially in the post secondary world, as we were saying earlier, Carleton University is the only um, university in Canada that has uh, such access, such physical access to all of its buildings uh, for the physically disabled. Um, so uh, throughout my years there, I know that, um, you know, it. Uh, I bumped into many different people from all over Canada who, and many even from the States or in, internationally. Um, uh, it, so uh, for instance, I even met a friend of mine at Carleton who was going to Carleton, but I had met him originally when I lived in all, in Calgary. And then he was in his university years. And in order to you attend university fully on his own, he had to come to Carleton. Oh, that's, <clears throat> that's amazing. I mean, as a Carleton alumni, that makes me happy to hear, but. Yeah, um... and sorry, just uh, to add on to that, Megan, is that he, he was able to live in campus because of the attendance services program that benefits students with physical disabilities and it allows them to experience university uh, on every level. You're totally correct with that. I actually had a friend who worked with that program and seeing the work that she was able to do um, at the campus was it was pretty amazing. So um, Amazing. Thank you, Dominique and Hollis, for, for your input on that question. Um, I think we'll move on to the second question. If no one in the audience has any questions here, um, I've got a few more to pick your brain with. Um, so kind of transitioning back into contemporary time, um, what do disability rights look like in Canada today? Um, and what can Canadians do to continue to ensure that disability rights are respected and upheld in every area of society? Um, I think, uh, for instance, just uh, what my friend, as my friend Chris says, just making yourself present in uh, in in the public eye uh, is activism in the community, and uh, there are many more, um, you know. Uh, physically or even any, you know, many more disabled individuals that are able to be present and living, just living their daily lives now um, because of modern technology, uh, such as uh, that uh, elevator technology and many others that are being developed in uh, the 21st century as I uh, and I, I speak about a lot a lot about this on my podcast because um, you know it's uh, the modern world is truly making disability be, um, become more of a social issue rather than a medical issue where uh, the problem is not lays not with you as a disabled person. The problem is with the environment around you making you disabled. That's very insightful. Um, I, uh, I have a few things to say about this. You, you know, the elevator project, when we started that, uh, you know, the building where we did the piloting is for for floors up right so it, and it's the only elevator in the building so if the elevator doesn't work I can climb the stairs but Hollis can't use the building right so 
But if you think about it, you know, next door is a tower with 21 floors and there's an elevator there. And so you could say an elevator is access in itself because without elevators, you have no skyscrapers. So this is a case where, you know, the kind of social definition of disability matters. Like in, in front of a skyscraper of, you know, 75 floors, we're all not very able, right? So uh, it's very relative, all this. Uh, and the other thing is you were asking what can uh, we do so when uh, all this say, you know, make yourself available or, you know, uh, people with disability are, you know, not waiting for you anyway. Uh, I can say that to me, to start studying disability more comes completely from my students. I'm a historian of social policies and I was chugging along doing social policies and more and more and more students wanted to study uh, topics with disability and amongst them more and more students who themselves had disability and so uh, as a topic it became interesting but also as a way of I have to develop ways of teaching that are not what I started with and there really um, it's what our colleague in sociology Kelly Fritch says who does uh, what do you call it, CRIP studies or um uh, critical disability studies. It's really taking the opportunity and the chance that working with people with disability offer to expand your life, right? To, and in my case, my pedagogy and the topics that I am uh, studying and to take this as an opportunity. And so on the bright side, as an opportunity to do, you know, more things in many more ways, but there's also uh, a, a way also to start thinking more critically about what you do. Like as a historian, I've been seeing for decades, you know, when you study wars, you study casualties. So you see death and you see um, uh, people who are injured and, or, and, and, you know, that category injured is always massive. And I, I never really think about it or didn't too much like hospital rehabilitation, whatever, but it's really war seeing you know and there's a book that really transformed how i saw that the right of maiming like war and armies that uh attack not to kill but to maim and create disability and how the disability movement itself yeah. is really asking you cannot advocate only for one kind of disability in one part of the world but if you are truly you know advocating you should also criticize the foreign policy of your country which is using maiming as a as a way to fight. So there is all sorts of things that uh, are open up when you start to put ability at the middle of what you're doing. Wow, that definitely transforms how I think about the topic. And I, I think that our viewers definitely take away um, some new positions after that. So thank you, uh, Dominique and Hollis. So now we have time for one more question. <clears throat> Sorry about that. So, in the chat, Sandy says, Hollis, do you see a near future of a disabled activism that brings different disabled groups together, or one that works from the individual strength of a single group? What are the advantages of groups working together? Oh, Hollis, I think you're muted. <laughs> thank you, Megan. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Sandy, for the question, and yes, uh, I do see a near future of activism of groups coming together to make um, things better. Uh, for instance, um, years ago, actually, well, not years ago, uh, in, in recent years, I used to volunteer at um, the Folk Festival of Ottawa and the Blues Fest. And I was asked to complete a accessibility audit of the festival. And when I thought about it, I was thrilled to do so and um, to stay on the project. But then I realized that, you know, in order to do a full accessibility audit, I wouldn't be able to um, give them an accurate uh, answer without contemplating or getting opinions from people with other disabilities. 
So I've drawn together a group that had um, different abilities. There is some who could, could walk, but uh, had difficulty walking. Others could hear or not hear. Others could see or not see. And so we um, came together to uh, tell Blues Fest how to make their experience more accessible. Um, and so in the end, that makes the festivals or just um, a public event more successful and more accessible to all. <laughs> and because, especially because like, you know, as we age, everybody becomes disabled in one way or one or another as as they age, it's a fact of life. Um, and it's the only um, minority uh, that, you know, where anybody can really become a member of. So I think, does that maybe answer your question? Amazing, thank you, Hollis. And Dominique, I think that wraps up our lecture for the evening, uh, but I'd like to thank you both again for working with me to create this initiative. And I think it was a wonderful evening and I know we put a lot of hard work into it. So thank you both for your time and effort. It was greatly appreciated. And I'll be in touch um, with final details at the end of our lecture. Um, but to our audience, thank you so much for attending tonight. I'd like to encourage everyone to attend our next lecture on the 16th with the Three Sisters Artists Collective. They're going to look at uh, mural art and revitalization. So it'll be an amazing night. Uh, but for the rest of the night, enjoy your evening. And again, I thank you for attending um, our lecture tonight on Disability Rights and Advocacy with Dominic and Hollis. Thank you, Megan. Thank of you. Of course. Thank you, everyone. Do you, do you want us to stay a bit, Megan? Um, I'll send you to an email. But for now, okay. thank you both again for making this work. It was such a, a good night. And I wanted to see yeah. Excellent. Oh my God, it's good to you both. It was a wonderful, a wonderful. And I wanted to thank you, Megan, to make us think about Ottawa, because I think we never took that, uh, Hollis and I never looked at it that way, like we do Canada, whatever. So really to take the time to say, okay, what is it about Ottawa that is, you know, interesting and special? Sure. So that was for yeah. us an occasion to do that. Thank you. Yeah, oh, absolutely. In our meetings, yeah. we were having like, in Ottawa? What? Yeah. 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 Totally, I totally get it. I think I'm from Toronto, so looking at um, how Ottawa is, is centered around various things is also like a new experience for me as well. So uh, I'm glad I made you think, and I yeah. so thank very, you. I'm very inspired by you both. So again, thank you so much. I'll be in touch about um various things. Hollis, you know, can I call you on the phone just yeah. to talk a bit? Okay, I'll call you in a minute. Okay, okay. thank you. Have a good night, Megan. Bye bye. Have a good night to you both. Bye.